Intel, a company famed for their very successful line of x86 processors. But in the very tail end of the 1980s, they tried to create themselves a RISC CPU, and it did not go well. Yes, it's time to talk about Intel's i860. Before we get into all the nerdy detail, I should say this video is sponsored by PCBWay, a fine purveyor of printed circuit boards. Yep, you design your circuit boards, you upload the design, and PCBs come back in the post, in exchange for money. And to think you thought that their main job was just to sponsor YouTube channels. I should mention before we get into everything that if you're thinking, his voice sounds a little bit croaky, you're, you're right, it does. I'm recording this bit just after I got back from Retrofest, which you can think of as the UK's equivalent of VCF. And um, my voice is a little bit strained from talking to all you nice people out there. I mean, there were literally hundreds of you. For all those who came up and said hi, it was great getting to meet and chat to all of you. And some of you were very kind. I also got to see one colleague who normally lives at the other end of the country, so that was a pleasant surprise. Anyway, enough of that. Back to Intel. So the first thing you might find yourself wondering is, why would Intel, this very successful chip vending company that had its own line of processors, that are very much not RISC processors, suddenly decide it wants to make a RISC processor. Well, despite the fact that the 1980s had been Intel's most successful decade so far, and that hordes of IBM-compatible PCs have been flooding out the door, mostly containing Intel processors, the times and the market were a-changing. RISC during the 1980s had become a thing, and high-end workstation vendors were all producing their own RISC-based CPUs to run their version of Unix upon and these chips were significantly more powerful than anything Intel had produced up until this point. The PC market was also maturing. No longer were companies thinking, should we get a computer or not? Every business was aware that they needed a computer for their administration functions, payroll accounts, design, etc. Anything that wasn't a physical thing that they did. The question was now about, could they get a machine powerful enough to do the things that they wanted to do? and the price that they were going to pay for that. And Intel was very aware that the technology market moves quickly. One day you can be the most important technology that's used by almost everyone and then some innovation appears and that's it, your business is dead. See the Palm Pilot for details. So Intel knew it must also innovate. And it better have a risk chip too, because the market could go that way. They were also getting some pressure from their most important partner, Microsoft, who were looking to make a more professional workstation operating system. That would eventually result in us getting Windows NT. And Microsoft were worried that the i386 line of processors was not really up to the task of being a professional workstation machine. And they had made Intel aware of that fact. And machines that ran Microsoft's operating systems in the form of DOS and Windows were basically most of Intel's processor market. And by most, I mean the other things were practically a rounding error. So Intel is very aware that there is a need for them to do something. Now, in the end, as we all know, this did not result in anything that could be considered commercially successful. And luckily for Intel, they didn't just bet on this RISC CPU being the only thing that they did. They did keep improving the x86 line of processes, so we got the 486, and most importantly, we then got the Pentium, and that's where Intel's success as a CPU vendor really exploded. But Intel does not know that that's their future at this point, and how that's how it's going to work out. So they do put a proper serious effort into this RISC CPU. This is not just some form of box ticking exercise so they can say that they have a risk product. I mean, they had already ticked that box a couple of years ago with the i960, a risk processor they released in 1988 aimed at being an embedded systems processor. And that thing had actually done pretty well. And if you ever bought yourself a RAID controller in the 1980s or even into the mid 90s, you would have seen one of these chips flat bang in the middle of the thing. They ended up in a lot of things from printers to X terminals, even running aircraft. But it was not designed with the idea of being the main CPU for a computer in mind. It always intended it for this embedded market and it had done really well in it. This is the first time with the i860 that they were intending on building a processor that was going to be the main CPU for a computer. Now Intel was also going to embrace what was the hot new thing in CPU design in the computer science world at least, the very long instruction word. Now a very long instruction word is an instruction that contains many sub-instructions, with each sub-instruction being a basic RISC instruction. Now the idea being that you can hand this very long word instruction over to the CPU and the CPU can execute all the sub-instructions in parallel, allowing you to get a lot more performance out of your CPU, in theory. However, very long word instruction sets require the CPU to be able to fill 
those instructions out. However, in reality, that's not quite practicable all the time, because programs do really annoying things like branch and run different bits of logic based on variables, and what with your compiler not being sentient, it's got no way to work out which way those branches are gonna go and prep the instructions together in the right groups. So yes, while it does allow for some instruction paralyzation, a lot of the times it just doesn't work out that well. But at this point, Intel's not to know that. They probably thought compilers could do a better job than it turned out they could. However, later on when it came to the Itanium, they had no excuses whatsoever because they should have learned off this thing. Yes, Intel really does seem to have a certain stubbornness when it comes to failing to learn the lessons of the past. Now, in the case of the 860, this meant, in practice, the actual performance of the CPU was nowhere near what Intel predicted it would be, because compilers just could never get to perform like it could do in theory. But that's not what made this thing a failure. I mean, it didn't help, but it's not what meant that it was fundamentally just unsuitable for being a general purpose CPU in a computer. No, the thing that really killed it is its lack of any hardware features to deal with context switching correctly. If the CPU got an interrupt, which is pretty essential for dealing with any other hardware, well, that could trigger the CPU to essentially dump all its pipeline, so the ALU, the FPU, all of that pipeline should just have to get blanked down so it could then run the code related to the interrupt. Now you might think, what's the problem, you can just reload that from memory, right? Well, here's where it gets really bad. The timings to get those pipelines refilled and up and running again were somewhere between 62 cycles, in the best case, and at the worst case, 2000 cycles. So for a chip clocked at 40 megahertz, which was the first clock speed that this chip was available in, it could take 50 microseconds to go from finishing handling an interrupt to getting back to what you were doing before. For a CPU, that's not a small amount of time. In fact, that is a small eternity in CPU world and is in fact such a big flaw that it basically killed this chip dead, at least in the general CPU market. But unsurprisingly, Intel did not make a big deal of this particular flaw and tell everyone who is interested in their CPU about it. No, they had to find out on their own. Yes, it's now time to talk about Microsoft and Windows NT. Now, being their first foray into doing a workstation operating system, Microsoft initially were not thinking of this thing as a replacement for DOS and Windows. They were thinking of their workstation offering as a very different market segment, and therefore, this thing did not need to be based on some i386-based processor. No, initially, the plan was this was going to be exclusively for Intel's new RISC processor, at that point, codenamed the 910 which is what the NT in Windows NT stood for. Now, in case you're thinking, oh, but that's just apocryphal, isn't it? Nope. No, a number of Microsoft developers from that point in time when NT was first getting developed have told us explicitly so. So Dave Plummer, for example, has posted on Twitter telling us exactly that. And also, so has Dave Cutler in an interview I've watched. Yes, everyone who originally worked on NT was called Dave. Okay, that bit may be apocryphal. But not too far into the early development cycle for Windows NT, once Dave Cutler had taken over, having recently been brought in from deck, they worked out just how unusable the 910 actually was, or 860 as we'd know it. And then again is all that massive issue they have around context switching, as that's something an operating system has to do a lot, especially when you're trying to build a modern workstation operating system. When machines were running DOS, almost all context switching was done when you triggered an interrupt, because it's a single tasking operating system. There's not multiple processes running in parallel. In a workstation operating system, that's not true. There are many processes being run by multiple users. And if you have a single core processor, like this one is, then the tasks that are running in parallel, well, they're not really running in parallel. What's happening is your chip is context switching between all the tasks. And if your processor is absolutely awful at context switching, I mean, terrible, then the end result is your operating system runs about as well as a dog with its legs cut off. So this is why we never see NT released on Intel's RISC platform. Microsoft stopped all development for it and instead moved on to supporting the likes of MIPS and PowerPC and later Alpha. And finally, they added their last instruction set, which they refer to as IA32, but we all know as x86. Now, despite Microsoft dropping support for it in Windows NT early into the development cycle, there were some machines based on this CPU. OQ are probably best known for their serial-based dot matrix printers. They produced a workstation, as did Stardent, that ran Unix. 
Halpage or Halpage, however you want to pronounce them, they produced the machine, as did Olivetti, although Olivetti's workstation also had a 486 on the board as well. Intel also made a number of supercomputers that were based on this chip as well. Now that supercomputer would let you have 128 CPUs, and of those 128, they could either be a 386 or an i860. Now this actually didn't work too badly, as if you had a couple of 386 chips that were handling all the interrupts related to hardware that needed servicing in the machine, the i860 didn't need to context switch and therefore didn't just fall asleep for a surprisingly long period of time. Essentially in the supercomputer you could use that chip more like you'd use a GPU now and that you fire a targeted workload at it rather than using it as the general processor for the machine. I mean admittedly then you add all the problems with the compiler and the very long word instruction but the 860 would perform a lot better in that scenario than it would when being used as a general CPU. In fact, the most famous thing to probably originate on that platform is the Tachyon Ray Tracing software, which apparently ran pretty well on that machine, you know, for the time. But managing to sell a machine to Oak Ridge isn't exactly what you call a success if that's the only thing you really manage to do with it. And in the workstation space, which is where they intended the CPU to be used, it was an absolute utter failure, with only a handful of machines ever using it and none of those machines really achieved any commercial success. So it should not be that surprising by the mid-1990s Intel had discontinued the chip, although there would still be some manufacturers using new old stock as an accelerator for their particular workload. I believe they were mostly in the aerospace industry. If you're a Next fan, as in the Unix workstation people, it was used in the heart of their really expensive graphics card, the Next Dimension. Now originally with that card, the whole display postscript stack was supposed to run on the graphics card. But they never did manage to get that feature complete before they released the card and didn't finish the feature after the card was released. Hence it being famous for being a very expensive add-on that really didn't improve performance in the way that was promised. Probably the biggest reason for its cancellation though was the upcoming Pentium. Whilst developing this new processor and a number of other projects, Intel had kept developing their x86 line of chips with each generation seeming to bring more revenue Intel's way. But the biggest jump in that is probably the Pentium. With that chip, Intel had finally created a chip that could compete in the workstation market. It was not the fastest, but it probably was good enough. And that combination of good enough and fast enough did kind of help make the Pentium become the default processor for Windows NT for virtually all users of it. I mean, the situation with NT and especially server became well, we'll try it on a Pentium, and if that's not fast enough, then we could always just buy an Alpha machine and put it on that instead. Now, you'd think all of this would put Intel off the idea of making another long word risk CPU aimed at a workstation slash server market and just concentrate on x86 and keep improving it. Now, luckily, they did keep working on x86 to the point where in the next generation after Pentium, that thing essentially became a risk processor with a Cisco instruction decoding engine wrapped around the outside of it to make it compatible with all which had gone before. But unfortunately for Intel shareholders, they really weren't done with the whole risk CPU with a very long word instruction thing yet. Because after the distinct failure of the i860, Intel apparently did not learn their lesson. No, because they steamed straight ahead and brought us Itanium. Probably the single biggest mistake that any large tech company has made and survived. Yep, that absolute lemon of a processor would be a millstone around Intel's neck until, well, just a year or two ago. If you're interested in that complete disaster of a processor, I do actually have a video I've already done on that one, which I will link in the description below. And you can see that epic disaster unfold in the full knowledge that they really should have seen it coming. Now, you may have wondered why you've not been seeing a whole bunch of Intel machines being filmed showing this processor off. Because normally when I talk about a machine or a processor line, I have something that I film that is that machine or contains that thing in the background. But as I mentioned earlier, this thing did only appear in a handful of workstations, none of which were commercially successful, or the odd supercomputer. So there was never very many of them around to begin with, and given that their users tended not to have fond memories of them, even fewer of them survived. So there were not going to be any around for me to buy and purchase and film and display to you, and also I try not to buy things that are basically just going to be a prop that I am not going to use at all, outside of filming just one video, as it doesn't feel like a good use of money or in fact space in my house. But more importantly, there might actually be a fan of these machines out there who genuinely wants one, and I don't want to be the person who stops that sadomasochist from getting that machine. We don't have to help drive up the price of every single retro device out there just because it happens to be retro. 
Well, that about wraps things up for the Intel i860, and I do like that my channel is fulfilling the remit that one of my viewers once gave it, which is to document the crimes of Microsoft and the failures of Intel. Well, that's one more Intel failure documented. If you got all the way to this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, there's a little thumbs up button you can press that tells YouTube that that happened. If you didn't, well, there is another button and, well, we won't speak of it. Once again, thank you to all of those who came up to see me at RetroFest. It was lovely getting to meet all of you. And if you would like to help the channel out, well, there's a little subscribe button-y thing, which when combined with the bell icon, does the thing you probably think it should have done in the first place. But mostly it tells the algorithms that these videos exist and people might like to watch them.